Welcome to the Real Estate Syndication Show. Whether you are a seasoned investor or building a new real estate business, this is the show for you. Whitney Sewell talks to top experts in the business. Our goal is to help you master real estate syndication. And now your host, Whitney Sewell. This is your daily real estate syndication show. I'm your host, Whitney Sewell. Today's guest is called The Real Deal by Forbes. His name is Matthew Pollard. Welcome back on the show, Matthew. And I'm ecstatic to be here. Thanks for having me back on. Yeah, so I'm, I'm excited to have you back. I know you are doing some big things right now. I know there's many listeners right now that you can help. And especially some books you've written recently, I think are going to relate to, I mean, it could relate to me for sure, personally, and many of the listeners as well. But a little about Matthew, go back and listen to show WS309. And we talked about just using the power of storytelling uh, during that show. I think it was August 26th of 2019, but a great show to encourage you to get to know Matthew uh, a little more through that. But also just in case you didn't hear it, he's a best-selling author of The Introvert's Edge, Amazon's eighth most sold book of the week and book authorities number two, a best introvert book of all time. His soon-to-be-released second book, The Introvert's Edge to Networking, has already received endorsements from Harvard, Princeton, Neil Patel, Michael Gerber, Dr. Ivan Minster, and Marshall Goldsmith. His humble beginnings, the aver- uh, adversities he faced, and his epic rise to success show anyone with the right motivation and the right strategies can achieve anything they set their mind to. Matthew, again, welcome to the show. Always a pleasure to speak with you. I've learned a lot from you personally, and I know the listeners uh, will uh, as well. Uh, you know, I want to jump into this, uh, you know, th- this thing that you are helping so many people with right now, and that, that's networking, right? And in our business, I know the listeners know this, uh, it, it's so important. I mean, it is everything, right, about the business is networking, putting yourself out there, being willing to go shake someone's hand, uh, and that's so hard for so many people. Uh, but, you know, let's jump in. Matthew, get us started with maybe what's happening with you recently and let's dive into this uh, the, maybe we'll go back a little bit to the success of your previous book and and why that how that's helped so many people and we'll move forward yeah absolutely well firstly you know i want to congratulate I mean, you've done over 300 episodes since we since we last got together that's that's impressive and i'm not sure if your audience knows that you're an introvert but you know the, the fact that you know that you're an introvert and you get up and you do this every day to provide your audience you know some amazing content i mean that, that's great and i mean i'm sure you've grown your network uh, by doing this substantially by doing out about it well so i mean the success of the the first book is uh you know Really, really exciting for me. I mean, you know, a lot of people that may or may not know this if they know my brand, but I didn't want to write this book. Uh, you know, I, I, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. And because of that, you know, I, I mean, I kind of fell into sales because I was horribly introverted and I, I, I just learned to sell by watching YouTube videos and discovered that it was a system just like anything else. And I kept, once I succeeded and, you know, I built five multi-million dollar businesses from the ground up and I came to the US and I started teaching people how to succeed in what I call my rapid growth system. I started sharing about step three of my system, which is around sales systemization. And people kept coming up afterwards and saying, Matt, I loved all of your content, but I had no idea I could succeed as an introvert. So of course, not wanting to write a book, I started to suggest to everyone I knew that was successful in sales that they should write a book on introverted selling. And I was told no one's going to buy a book on introverted selling, Matt, nobody. And I'm in my head because, you know, step two of my system is around niche marketing. I'm like, this is an open niche that no, I mean, there are thousands of books and nobody's written one for sales. I really believe it'll succeed. And I believe it's super necessary because introverts needed a book for them, but nobody would write it. And it was, it was really happenstance. You know, I worked with a ghostwriter as a, you know, he was a client of mine, and, you know, he made 27000 in 2013, 12000 by October of 2014. And within, two, you know, four weeks of us working together, he'd made 40000 Within six weeks, he'd made eighty. By the end of the year, he'd made 120. dollars And the end of the following year, he made just shy of three hundred. Actually, he made two hundred dollars just in April the following year. And he's like, Matt, you've got to put this con- these concepts down into a book. And I said, you know, I... I- I've wanted to for a long time, but because of my reading and spelling issues, I mean, I'm an award-winning blogger, but I, I mean, I yell at you for 1500 words and no introvert wants to get yelled at for 50,000 words. Right. So I wanted, you know, if it was going to be a book, I wanted it to be this comfortable process where somebody just learns the process of selling, but they learn through characters, almost like a novel where they get to enjoy these people and just happen to learn selling through the process. And so we agreed to work together on that book. And 
I mean, as soon as we got the book out, we had people like Jeb Blunt talk about his introversion. We had, you know, Tom Ziegler, uh, the the CEO of Ziegler um, Inc., who, you know, talked about his dad, Zig Ziegler, who was introverted. And all of these amazing introverted start, start, introverts started to come out. And, you know, I mean, the book did 25,000 copies in the first year. It, you know, is now translated into, uh, well, 10 languages, it looks like at the moment. And, you know, we keep getting new, uh, you know, new uh, languages or publishers from that represent different languages come to us and, and talk about it. So we're just really excited about what it's, it's done for the introverted community. And we just kept getting people asked, you know, when are we, when are we going to write the next one on, on networking? Why isn't there one on networking? And I'm like, gosh, I, you know, I, I write slow, you know, even with, with a ghostwriter, I have to go through every paragraph. And, you know, for me, it's grab the text, listen to it in a robot voice, you know, add comments. And it's, it's, it's a horrible, you know, process. It just takes forever. But, you know, we, we're launching it on, on January 19, the introverts edge to networking. And we're ecstatic to hear how, you know, we're already getting these amazing editorial reviews. So we're really excited about it. Nice. Well, who, so maybe you can describe a little bit of who that first book is for, like what, what's that going to solve for them? And then, you know, and then moving into the second book as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so my primary audience is always small business owners. So, I mean, that that's why, I, you know, I love your show because, you know, a lot of the people that are you know, in real estate syndication, I mean, they really run their own small businesses, right? So even if they're you know, passive investors, they have a business on the side where they're investing and, you know, they've got to find the right deals. So, the, you know, for me, I've always been heavily focused on the small business community. But, you know, what's been interesting is obviously the book has a lot of small business stories and it shares, you know, stories of real introverts. A lot of times, you know, much worse off than the people that are actually reading and people with chronic stutters that have, you know, created seven figure businesses from nothing through learning a sales system. So that's really what it, it was designed for to help small businesses small business owners realize that they actually can sell and that they, they can learn a sales system just like anything else. And, you know, that really was a focus because I think there's so, so many small businesses that are stuck in this constant hustle to, you know, set themselves apart, find interested prospects and make the sale. And the, there's so many, many leads that are coming in that they think are, are rubbish, but it's really because they're not closing them well. So I wanted to stem the bleeding a little bit with that. Then with the, what we found was quite exciting was, you know, the, the corporate world. I mean, they were, they were buying this book like crazy because especially in the world of technical sales, you know, technology, medical finance, I mean, these people, are, a lot of them are super introverted and even the ones that aren't are like, oh my gosh, it's so overwhelming the amount of data I've got to provide. And, you know, they really gravitated to how I talk about storytelling and how to simplify using what I call value articulated, emotionally driven stories. So it really exploded in two different markets. Again, with the next book, I, I focused on the same thing. I mean, my primary market is always the small business community, but I've been blown away. I mean, we've received endorsements from, you know, VPs of IBM, uh, you know, sales directors from Intel, amazingly high level people in the corporate world. But again, it, it's predominantly focused on, on small business to help them realize how to get out of that hamster wheel of finding interested prospects and setting themselves apart so that they don't get stuck. I mean, let's face it, when we go to networking events, either, you know, face-to-face -face virtually or even reach out to people on, you know, social tools like LinkedIn, so often we introduce ourselves as, well, let's say I call myself a business coach or a branding expert. People go, oh, I, I tried that before. It didn't really work for me. And now it's a really awkward conversation. Or they say, oh, I need that. How much do you cost? And now we're talking about price. We've just met them. How awkward is that? So for me, I created this book to really help people realize there is a way to change the balance in a networking conversation, even if it's a virtual conversation, to getting them to lean forward and go, oh, well, that's interesting. Tell me a little bit more about that because they genuinely care. But then also giving people a regimented system because in my world, I mean, when you go and see networking the way people do it, it's either that transactional, do you want to buy from me? No, do you want to buy from me? And no introvert wants to do that. I mean, most extroverts don't want to do that. Or you've got those other people that are like, I'm not going to be that person. So they're kind of aimless in their, their focus. They 
try to avoid conversations about what they do. They they say it's all about building genuine connection, but then they go home with a couple of business cards that they fostered relationships with, but no real to-do list of what to do with them. And they've already got enough friends. I mean, they struggle to spend enough time with the friends they have. So those cards just sit on the desk and they do nothing with them. They just say, oh, when they reach out to me, I'll do something. And of course they never do, which makes them walk out going, you know, networking's you know, a waste of time. That's not true. It works. You're just doing it wrong. So what I'm introducing is what I call strategic networking, which really means that 90% of the work happens why you're before you even go in the room. Because if, if you aren't prepared, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have stories and a way of introducing yourself that separates you, well, then when you get into the room, it doesn't really matter what you do. You're always going to get subpar results. And then again, these days in the digital world, I mean, you can know who's going to be in the room well before you even go and start the dialogue beforehand. So you already have a plan. Those people that plan and prepare, especially introverts who need to plan and prepare, will dominate in the networking room. And even in virtual, it's proving to be even more the case. Awesome. Well, you mentioned so many things there, a bunch of notes, and I want to dive into some of that. Uh, you know, helping the listener. I mean, it's so important uh, what you just said uh, in our business, you know, we're obviously most people listening, if they're trying to be an active syndicator, operator, purchase commercial property, they're, you know, growing their base of investors is crucial. I mean, you have to have the base of investors, right? And, and it is so much about knowing how to enter the room, knowing how to have that conversation and having a follow-up, right? Uh, and I love how you talked about strategic networking and just being prepared ahead of time and having something that separates you. And I always talk about how now, when I, you know, if you're going into a room and we'll go to conferences, there may be 400 people there and everybody's talking about real estate, right? And they're not going to remember who you are if you just talk to them about real estate too, you know, a week from then, right? So have something that separates you. Uh, and that's our big why, our mission behind our business is what separates us. And people remember that a week later when I follow up, you know, and so, uh, so help the listener with that a little bit, Matthew, you know, getting out there, let's start, let's go back a little bit, but setting yourself apart, getting out there a little bit. That's difficult for so many, right? They're scared to death to enter that room full of people and have to go up to a stranger and talk to them. Um, and, you know, how do you help people get past that? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing is know how you're going to differentiate yourself because everyone's like, oh, you know, maybe it's going to be that story and, or maybe I should use an elevator pitch. Well, for most introverts, an elevator pitch, if you're like me, feels contrived and uncomfortable. And it also people that hear it know that you're selling. So of course, they're going to be a little bit standoffish. Actually, you know what, we t let's talk about Shane, because Shane was a guest on your podcast. Gosh, it, it probably was hundreds of episodes ago for you. But um, it was. You know, uh, yeah, Shane's a great friend and, and a great guy. And he it was hundreds of shows ago. But yeah, awesome. <laughs> Well, actually, I can tell you the advice that I, I the advice I gave him when he went home and spoke to his wife and his father in law, they were like, "What are you doing? This is not going to work." And I mean, you've 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 heard his story about how his business has exploded since. But you know, when he first came to me, he had a real issue with talking about you know syndications. So his father in law introduced him to a whole bunch of people, and he got you know his first couple of clients that way. But anyone that didn't come through a trusted source, people would ask him what he did. He said, "Oh." I mean, commercial real estate syndication and people would go, I mean, to me, it sounds like, a, I mean, I understand it's a very good way to make money and it is a very good way to make money. But to those people that have never heard of it before, even if they make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, it sounds like I'm getting invited to join a Ponzi scheme. And don't you know, call yourself a syndicator. Right? Oh, absolutely not. So, you know, with Shane, what was interesting is when he first came to me, you know, Shane is a very logical brain person an amazing at what he does, but so logical. And he thought he's he, obviously his goal was to over explain everything. So people understood everything. I mean, you imagine, I mean, there's a lot that goes into syndication. If you try and download all of it in the first 10 minutes of a conversation, it doesn't matter how smart the person on the other side is, they're going to be like, Oh, let me think about it. I got to run away. But how do you even get that dialogue happening? So for Shane, he found that he would say that he was in commercial real estate or he did real estate syndication and people would like, oh yeah, no, I'm not really interested in that or I've heard about that before. So what I did is firstly, I helped have a look at what he was doing and I started to really analyze that some of the clients that he'd worked with were working in medical 
And, you know, there were doctors, there were surgeons, that sort of thing. And that was really the group that he really loved working with. And these are the people that have a small amount of time, right? They earn great money, but they have a tiny amount of time to actually go out and work out what to do with, you know, with, with their money to invest it correctly. I mean, a lot of these people kind of find themselves in these golden handcuffs. I mean, I know for a lot of us, we're like, wow, these people are earning hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. We wish we had these problems. But I mean, they've got the fancy car, the fancy home, the kids at Harvard, and they're like, there's no end in sight. I have to go to work every day to pay all these bills. How do I get out of it? And, you know, they hear the stories of residential real estate and how you can make money out of residential real estate. Then they end up the landlord. They don't have time to do their due diligence like the people earning less than $50,000 do. And they just, you know, they end up spending less time at home, which they're already getting in trouble for. And because of that, they're like, oh, I just you know, I need a smarter way to invest my money. And I realized that that was what Shane really specialized in because his father-in-law was in that industry as well. You know, he was super passionate about helping that demographic. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, what they're really looking for is a way to be afforded opportunities because of their high salaries that other people can't get access to in a way that they can make amazing money. I said, if we were to focus just on that niche, what if we were to call you the arbitrage architect instead of anything to do with syndication? So the, the, just so that people understand, the definition of arbitrage is buy high, is a buy low, sell high, right? So the concept of arbitrage architecture is what we linked in with. So I said, what I want you to do is when you go to a networking event and somebody asks you what you do, I want you to just say you're the arbitrage architect. Now you think about what that does in a networking event. I'm in commercial real estate. Oh, I know what that is. I'm not interested. Or, oh, I've been thinking about that. Tell me about how you, you can help me. And now we're in sales, as opposed to, oh, arbitrage architect, I've never really heard of that before. Tell me a little bit more about that. Now you're getting the opportunity to explain on their invitation. It changes the entire balance. Now, if you know your niche, like Shane did with doctors, all of a sudden he's speaking to, he's going to places where medical people hang out. So all of the things that he shares are going to be directly applicable. So the way to shift everything at a networking event is not by calling yourself your functional skill, but coming up with your own version of the arbitrage architect. And then when somebody asks what that is, you then talk about your passion and mission. So Shane talked about his passion and mission for helping medical people get out of the golden handcuffs that they got themselves stuck in by realizing that they're afforded opportunities that most investors don't. And then he would transition into a story. Now, stories are key when you're talking about syndication because syndication is confusing, but also if you don't have their trust, they're not gonna write you a check for the amount of money it costs to get involved. So stories are based on science. So, sorry, the science behind story is key. So the first thing you need to understand is there's a study out of Princeton that says when I tell a story, what happens is our brains start to synchronize. What it does is activate the reticular activating system of our brain, which for the introverts out there, this allows us to create artificial rapport that we're masters at creating deep rapport from. It's why when I go on stage, and we were talking just before this interview about how terrified I am before I go on stage, yet I'm one of the top 50 speakers in the world. And the reason for that is I'm preparing the introductory part of my story. As soon as I get on stage, I start with, what a wonderful introduction. How will I live up to such a wonderful introduction? I know, let me tell you about Wendy. And then I tell a story. And then all of a sudden, my brain synchronizes with everyone in the audience and I feel at ease and they feel at ease and they feel engaged. And then I can then do what introverts, as I said, do amazingly, really foster that rapport. Now, the other thing that's great about stories is people remember 22 times more information when embedded into a story, which means all of that jargon all of a sudden becomes much more tangible to people and they remember it. And then on top of that, I mean, the other thing you've got to remember about story is it short circuits the logical brain and we speak directly the emotional brain. No one's going to sit and listen to a two hour lecture, but they'll sit and watch a two hour movie and wish it went for 30 minutes longer. So because of that, when you share a story, instead of people going, why has he been talking for 30 seconds and he hasn't stopped explaining what he did? I'm in a networking event. I want to meet other people. They're like, oh, story time. And they listen and they're engaged and they want to hear the ending. 
So the goal is that if you start with a unified message to get their invitation to tell more, if you talk about your passion and mission for helping that demographic, your niche market, and then lead into a story of someone like them that had the problems that they had and how you got them to an amazing result, these people are going to be hooked. And I mean, you know the story with Shane. I mean, the first time he said, I'm going to call myself the arbitrage architect to his wife and father-in-law, they thought like, what were you on? I mean, why would you call yourself anything else? But again, it doesn't work with your friends and family. It doesn't work with the people that know you. It's like walking up to them and going, I know you've been know- you, you've known me as Matthew for the last, you know, my whole life, but I want you to start calling me Jason. They're going to look like you sp- you, you, you've gone mad. But with Shane to the new prospects, he was having dialogues. And they were like, oh, that sounds amazing. I want to work with you. How do I work with you? And he, I mean, he launched a podcast. He, I mean, he had a Uh, It was a doctor's association, 3,000 doctors reach out to him about how they can collaborate. He created a consulting business, a six-figure business on the side, just helping other people do it because his business was doing so well. And instead of hustling to get opportunities for investors and deals, they were actually reaching out to him. It was like he got first choice at the best deal. So his business exploded. The difference is all about not being like everyone else, but also not filling their heads with the jargon, but instead making sure that they see the value through someone else's experience. Of course, at that point, you need a great sales system, which is why I'm happy that we now have both books. It's awesome. I mean, creating that version like Shane did of what we call ourselves. So it cre- it, it draws people in, right? It creates that curiosity. Uh, you know, so let's say we've done that. Uh, it, I think it's so helpful having a story or a few stories. If you are, especially an introvert, I think you're going to be much more confident going into that conversation, right? Feeling like you know what to say. How, how do you coach people a little bit through, oh, we just have a few minutes, but uh, help us to create that story. Uh, you know, what, what can the listener do to, you know, really have that story on hand uh, that they can share with someone so they stand out? Yeah, absolutely. So first thing you need to realize is you don't need many stories. Everyone, when I, they hear me talk about story, they're like, firstly, they say, oh, I already tell great stories. No, you don't. Most people say, I, you know, I worked with the customer, they wanted this, so we gave it to them, right? I'm talking a story like how you met your husband or wife, right? You know, there's you, these emotional journeys about somebody's plight. You know, it's funny, I worked with a big tech company recently and they were like, oh, we moved this person to the cloud and we made all this money. And I was like, okay, but you said you've been chasing them for years. Why did they move into the cloud? Well, it tur- they didn't know. They had to go and find out. Well, it turns out that the company server crashed just before Christmas and they couldn't run payroll just before the biggest spending season of the year. Can you imagine being the technologist that was, in- it was their fault that no one got paid before Christmas? And also he had to keep his whole team back so everyone got paid before New Year's. So they all missed Christmas right? That was something they never wanted to happen again. Turns out he got a promotion at the end of it because he handled the situation so well, but that was because he worked with this organization, you know, worked with a, a gym franchise. And, you know, they were like, oh, so the, cu- the, pers- the customer wanted to cancel. So we gave them this fitness regimen and then they ended up losing the weight that they were looking for. So they were really happy and they stayed. Victory story. Great. Why were they trying to get pregnant? Uh, sorry, why, why were they? I gave it away there. Why were they trying to lose weight? Well, she was trying to get pregnant. She couldn't get pregnant. I said, how do you think she felt beforehand? Were her, were her parents happy that they're now going to be grandparents? Those emotional triggers, most people don't talk about. And with doctors, I mean, you've got these people, you know, hustling to make money and then they spend money on investment opportunities quickly and lose more often than they win because they don't have the time to do the due diligence. And they feel like they're going to be working till they're old and gray. Now, all of a sudden, their life is transitioned. They can spend more time. A lot of these people in, you know, with commercial real estate syndication can replace their medical income because of their medical income within you know, four or five years. But they never saw that to be ever possible. They gave them that, that you know, the light at the end of the tunnel that they wouldn't have had before. So because of that, right, that's the emotional journey of them feeling stuck and them feeling like to everyone else, they seem like a success. The last thing they want to do is share a sob story, but they are stuck. And then all of a sudden that relief, the pressure that almost leaves the chest. So for me, a good story really has four parts, but part one and part three is the problem and the outcome. And most people focus on just the real cost of the problem. I focus it on three things. You have the real cost, the opportunity cost, and the emotional cost of the problem. Most people, if they talk about a problem, they'll only talk about the real cost. They never really talk about the opportunity cost. 
which, I mean, it's very easy in syndication to say, well, the opportunity cost is by investing in the wrong things. You're not getting yourself, you know, in, you know, not getting yourself the ROI that you need. But the opportunity, the emotional cost is the thing that most people never think about, which is what is it doing for the doctor's life? How are they feeling right now? And then when you get into the transformation, you know, you, was the real cost realized was, or was the, you know, was the opportunity cost realized and how do they now feel? I mean, some of these emotional stories, when you change someone's life, Derek Lewis, the, the ghostwriter for my books, you know, I've got a testimonial from him and sure he wasn't making money and now he's making money. That's impressive. But when he says, you know, I don't fear a bill coming in anymore. You know, I walk outside, the sky looks brighter, the air feels cleaner. It's a different life. That is the thing that gives people tingles. And when you are at a networking event, those are the parts of the story you want to share. But also it's the part of the story that doesn't sound salesy, right? Because if you talk, I mean, I, I still get tingles down my arms when I talk about Derek because I feel awesome about the fact that I changed his life. And if you're in syndication and you don't get excited about the fact that you make an investor money or that you, you, know, you, you make a, a whole new development, you get to look at this amazing thing that you were part of, right? You're in the wrong business. But if you do get passionate about that, then you should be able to share those emotional parts inside your story and, will be, and people will be blown away by it. So we talked about point one and point three. Obviously, point two is transformation. It, it, it's the implementation. Now, most people want to get into really nitty gritty details for that. The customer doesn't care. The prospect doesn't care. You actually should spend the least amount of time outside the moral, which is point four, talking about that. You want to spend a huge amount of time. You know, movies do this where you talk about character development. We want to make sure that we really feel the person's plight. Then we just say there was an implementation and then we talk about the outcome. And then we just deliver the moral of the story. Because people, when they hear from you, especially at networking, they don't need to get into the jargon and the details. As a matter of fact, they're never really going to want that. What they really want to know is you work with someone just like them who had the same problems that they have, and you can deliver the same amazing outcome for them. Awesome, Matthew. Unfortunately, we got to go to a few final questions. I mean, we could talk about this all day, no doubt about it. Uh, Matthew, I, you know, I believe anyone that has a high level of success in business, and I'm sure you see this, but has a high level of self-discipline. How did you gain such a high level of self-discipline? Because the world really didn't work for me when I first started. I mean, <laughs> let's face it. I mean, I, I should never have been where I am today. I mean, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader, you know, horrible acne. I was really you know, not confident at all. If I didn't lose my job just before Christmas and get thrown into a commission-only sales role, I would have been probably a very happy person doing data entry my entire life. And, you know, I wouldn't have known what was possible for me, but I'd always had that grit to go and do the hard work. And I think it was my, it was really that hard work grit, but also my willingness to think differently. For instance, when, you know, I mean, if people go back and listen to that other episode, what was the number of that? Do you, do you have that again? Yes, that was 309. 309, more than 300 episodes again, almost 400 episodes uh, ago. So if people go back and listen to that, they'll hear the story of how my first day was after five days product training, getting thrown out on Sydney Road and it taking me 93 doors of reje rejection to get to my first sale. And at that point, I had to make a decision. You know, I made the first sale. I made $70. I was ecstatic for 45 seconds, but I then had to go, well, I got to do this again tomorrow. And that, I mean, that wasn't okay, that second realization. So I made, had to make a decision. And I think what happens is most people go into one of two worlds. They either, you know, fight or flight. They either give up and just say, no, not for me, which a lot of people in syndication do when they're literally just you know, days of practice away from doing amazingly well, but they give up because it's too hard in their head. Because let's face it, life really isn't that hard these days. Go back 200 years ago, poor was really poor, but doing badly now still has food on the table. The lights are still on. We've got a roof over our head generally. So a lot of times people give up before they need to. The other side of the coin is that fight mentality, which, I mean, the world loves this, you know, I'm a hustler, I'm going to grind it out. Well, grinding it out is fine as long as you're trying to improve as well. Otherwise, it was going to be, for me, 93 doors the next day, 107 the next day, you know, 45 the next day. I'd be relying on lady luck. And again, I'm not okay with that. Most people, though, accept that as the two opportunities, especially when it comes to sales. For me, I went, there has to be a smarter way. And I decided that sales had to be a system. And then I went about learning the system. 
Now, in Australia, you know, I became very successful at sales. I got promoted a bunch of times and then built five businesses from the ground up that all went multi-million dollar. But when I moved to the US, no one knew who I was. And in Australia, the only networks I had were because of my success in business. So I literally had to start again, but I learned that there has to be a system for that. So I went about creating one this time because I couldn't find anything outside the elevator pitch. And I was just not okay with that. It felt uncomfortable for me. So I went about creating a system that worked for me as an introvert. And now through the Introvert's Edge to Networking, I teach people that system. Nice. Uh, is there a daily habit that you have, Matthew, that you are very disciplined about that's helped you achieve success? Yeah. So I, I've got it right here. I have a list of must do's today um, that I have to get done and everything else, because a lot of people get distracted by their email all the time. So I write down a list, of, uh, you know, and I'll do it the night before and I'll do it the morning of, because the, the mind's an amazing thing. And it, thinks why we're asleep. So I wake up in the morning, I'll have breakfast and I'll ask myself the question, what is the things that I really need to get done today? Because a lot of times we get stuck in this anxiety of what we get, we feel anxiety because we, it's, it's our brain's way of, or our body's way, I should say, of signaling to us, we're not doing what we should be doing that's aligned with the direction we want to go. So what I find is, you know, in the morning, in the night before, if I write down what I want to achieve tomorrow and in the morning, I'll a lot of times cross out the things that I thought were important yesterday and replace them with other things that are absolutely essential today. I find I sleep better than overnight. I wake up and I've got a to-do list and it's always those things that I will do before I answer any emails or get to any of the busy work. Because if I get distracted by that stuff, now, sure, if there's some fires or things that highlight themselves as urgent, they make their way to my list. But usually I just give them a quick scan and end up just ticking off the things on my list, which leaves very little time for the email, but it's the way I get through life. What's a way you've recently improved proved your business, Matthew, that we could apply to ours? Well, you know what's interesting is if you had have looked at me before 30. You know, I've talked about the success of my past businesses, but they were all bricks and mortar telemarketing direct sales. And when I moved to the US, I decided if I ever wanted to visit my family back in Australia, then I needed to have an online business. But I didn't even know how to change the word that to the word they on a website. So I decided that I was going to learn the process of being online. And what I realized is the reason why people work so hard online is because they don't have great messaging, they don't have a great niche. And once you have all of that, you can create a system that in a lot of ways gets your ideal prospects to chase you. So, you know, what I find is people struggle to articulate in the networking room the value of what they provide in two, three minutes when somebody's trying to be nice to them and listen to them. In online, if you can't do it in two minutes in the networking room, think about how long your tab's going to stay open when they're looking at you online. So what I realized is that Today, I mean, in today's world, you can use technology, psychology, and strategy to get your ideal clients to chase you. So I learned how to do what I do online. And you know, now Global Gurus list me as one of the top 30 sales professionals in the world. And that's all because of my online presence. I mean, my book sales is all because of my online presence. To, in today's world, especially with COVID, if you don't know how to be crystal clear you know, with your messaging online, it's going to be a really hard time for you. So you, I would suggest to everyone that's listening to use this as an opportunity. I mean, my whole book to networking got a little bit of a twist at the end. The whole goal of my book on networking is to show you how you never have to go back into a networking room, unless you want to, of course. What's the number one thing that's contributed to your success, Matthew? Uh, I, I, I think it's that diligence, like we spoke about. It's, it's my diligence to f- finding a system. I don't just work hard without knowing that it's going to get easier, right? I I think a lot of people are just willing to accept life is difficult. And for me, I'm willing to accept life is going to be hard for a time, but I've got to create a system that's going to make it easy. So for me, it's automation, absolutely. But it's automation in every part of my business and systemization in every part of my business because if, I, if, if nothing's systemized, if nothing's automated, then today's hustle is going to be tomorrow's hustle. And I'm just, I'm not okay with that. How do you document, or is there, a, is there a system or something that you use to help document your systems and processes inside your business? Yeah, I actually use Trainial. Uh, Trainial is a great uh, SOP um, um, kind of um, place to just put all your, your procedures and, and documents. So I like Trainial a lot. Uh, we also, you know, with my with my sales scripts, uh, I have uh, well, I have a 
Word document that no one else sees in a Google document that runs between my team that people are allowed to, you know, ed, edit and customize and add comments about changes and things like that. Um, but, you know, sales scripts should always be living documents that change. But you should, again, when you're talking about sales scripting or you're talking about networking scripting or any type of scripting, first thing I know I use the word scripting, so don't get scared. Remember, every character that you see on TV that seems so natural and authentic actually is reading a script too. So you can, the difference is the people that sound robotic when they're cold calling you, those are the people that are reading it as for the first time or continuously because they haven't spent the time learning it and making it their own. But sales scripting, networking scripting is about going away and practicing it so you learn it. Once you have it locked down, you know, sales and networking scripts are like science experiments. If you change more than one thing at a time, you don't know what's blowing up in your face. So just change one thing at a time, test that it works or that it didn't work, and then change the next thing. How do you like to give back? So I have a conference uh, called Small Business Festival that didn't run this year because of COVID, but we'll be back next year, hopefully. Um, with, with, with the COVID situation, we'll, we'll be back on track by May. But I um, started a, a festival that puts on hundreds of free events across America every year. Uh, it actually was listed by Inc. as the number three conference in America for small business, and it's all free for people to attend. So that's kind of that's where I spend a, a lot of my time trying to help people succeed, you know, helping people realize that if they just break past their functional skill and focus on the elements outside that scope, then they really can have a rapid growth business that they love. It's that focus of I need to improve. Oh, but I'm going to improve in what I know that's costing them from succeeding in a business. Wow. Matthew, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. I always enjoy our conversation and learning from you personally. I know the listeners do as well. I hope they will look up your book, you know, The Introvert's Edge to Networking. It's such a common problem. It's interesting that, you know, you mentioned so many people said, oh, that's not worth writing a book on that or no, you know, we're not going to have any part of that. But, you know, there's so many people that have that problem, right? Uh, and, and you're helping them get past that. Tell the listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about you and the book. Absolutely. So my publisher hates me when I say this, but you don't need to buy my books. The, um, the, if you go to theintrovertsedge.com, you can actually download the first chapter of The Introvert's Edge on selling. And if you do nothing more, that will firstly, it will get you over that whole hurdle of believing that sales isn't possible for you as an introvert. But I actually outlined the full seven-step process for how you can uh, be an amazing salesperson. If you do nothing more than map out the first seven steps, put what you currently say in there, you'll realize that a bunch of things don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't be saying it to customers. Then you'll be able to make sure the stuff's in the right order and fill the gaps, which will likely be around storytelling and asking great questions. If you do nothing more than that, you'll double your sales in the next 60 days. And you can also go to theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking, and that will actually give you the first chapter of my second book. Uh, now, if, if you do want to pre-order that, if you're an introvert that's passionate about supporting this cause, please pre-order the book. And if you do, find me on LinkedIn and send me your receipt and I'll make sure you get all the pre-order bonuses that come with it. Uh, but, you know, every pre-order really helps us, you know, support uh, support getting that message out in front of the world. Uh, but, you know, those are the, probably the two places I would suggest. Uh, the other recommendation I would say is go to the, intro, uh, sorry, go to matthewpollard.com forward slash growth. And if you want to create your version of the arbitrage architect or the rapid growth guy, which is what I call myself, then you can go there and there's a five-step template that'll help you work out what your niche is and discover or create your own unified message. And, you know, I did this at the National Freelance Conference, nearly 200 people in the room, 97% of the rooms put their hands up at the end and said they had a message that they believe would resonate and they'd identified a niche of willing to buy clients. Sad part was I said, put your hand up, keep your hand up if it's the most time you spent on marketing since you started your business and 85% of the room odd kept their hands up. So this will absolutely work, but you've got to spend time actually doing it. Thank you for listening to the Real Estate Syndication Show brought to you by LifeBridge Capital. LifeBridge Capital works with investors nationwide to invest in real estate while also donating 50% of its profits to assist parents who are committing to adoption. LifeBridge Capital, making a difference, one investor and one child at a time. Connect online at www.lifebridgecapital.com for free material and videos to further your success.